as we continue looking at this, what we believe was Peter's memoirs, that Peter dictated to John Mark, who wrote them down and became what we know as the Gospel of Mark. Asking the question today, Jesus, are you with him or against him? From Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 41. I hope you have found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have it on the screen for you. I would ask you to stand with me as I read from God's Word and you follow along as I read, please. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. But the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. We need to stay out of ditches, two ditches, and stay on the evangelical path, gospel truth, and balance what is said in this passage that the one who is not against us is for us. And we read in Luke, the one who is not with us is against us. He who does not sow with us, gather with us, scatters to understand what it means to be with Jesus and against Jesus. Thank you. Please be seated. Once again, we have in this passage one of the disciples speaking up, no doubt thinking he was doing a good thing, no doubt thinking that what he would speak would be a blessing to Jesus' ears. John, one of the sons of thunder, James and John, who on another occasion saw people doing that which they thought was against Jesus, and wanted to call down thunder on them. Let's destroy them. Let's show them who's right. Let's show them who's boss. Well, this comes up again. It's not unique. You, if, if you look in the scriptures just real quickly with me, you have in Numbers eleven twenty-eight, 28, uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, who was, who was Moses' apprentice and ultimately his successor, we're told in Numbers eleven twenty eight, 28, And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. The episode going on there where there were those seemingly set against and opposed to Moses. The same thing is true with David. If you look at 2 Samuel three thirty nine, uh, these, these zeal, the zeal of these sons of Zeruiah, David says, I was gentle today, though anointed king. These men, the sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. There were, there's always been those, in other words, in the scripture who want to eradicate other opinions. Who want to eradicate those who are or seem to be against the cause. Well, we want to grant that John was sincere, but acknowledge that he was sincerely wrong. And Jesus points out as much. So in these few verses today, just think about three things with me, if you would. The, the disciples' complaint about outsiders. Second, Jesus' correction to their ministerial bigotry, or you could call it theological bigotry. Third, Jesus' challenge to minister in his name. Let's look at this together. This, it's subtle, but the, but the reality is, is striking. First of all, the disciples complain about outsiders. 
John, again, James and John, the brothers, sons of thunder, their, their mother would intervene for them at some point and ask, remember she says, Jesus, I want to ask you something, but I want you to promise to give me what I ask. Amazing. I want my sons to sit on your right and your left. and With no understanding, no idea that those who would be found on his right and his left would be thieves crucified on Golgotha. So John says to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop them. Because he was not following us. It's interesting. Basically, he's saying we we forbade someone from healing in your name because he wasn't part of our group. And it's also fascinating. They did not say we we saw someone doing this and we stopped him, tried to stop him because he was not following you. That's not what they said. He was not following us. There's a mentality already developing among the twelve that's still alive today. And it's this, Jesus, they would say, Jesus picked us. Jesus granted approval to us. And it's up to us to grant approval to anyone else who will be let into this merry band of followers of Jesus. But that's not true. It's not about us. And the disciples had made it about, about them, than about Jesus. They took a very narrow view that because Jesus called them, that there was a real exclusivity to who and what kind of and where from people he would call. It's a complaint about those who are different from us. Years ago, when I was pastoring in another place, engaged in a pretty intense, intensive work of reformation, bringing, bringing back biblical and baptistic ecclesiology, in other words, a, a, a doctrine of church, a doctrine of church membership from the scripture. And some folks got upset with me and summoned Karen and myself to their home. It was the mayor and his wife. And they wanted to register a complaint. And we talked about some of the complaints. And then we pointed out that the Lord had been bringing to us people from various backgrounds. Uh, at that time, point in time, we had, we had African Americans attending the congregation a church that was when founded in 1836 had members who had slaves. We were talking about how the Lord was expanding and their response was very telling. They said, well, yes, we are seeing people come, but they're the wrong kind of people. Now, I'd like to tell you that was in 1865, 1878. I'm not that old. It was, it was, in, it was in 19... 88. A critique of outsiders, of people different from us, of people who don't have our approval. In fact, folks, what you see here forming in the band of 12 is its own Pharisaic mentality. That's exactly how the Pharisees acted. And it should teach us, I've mentioned this before, I, I mentioned it to remind myself of it, that there is a Pharisee lurking in the corners of our hearts, waiting to be fed, waiting to be stroked, waiting to be encouraged. And he will step up and say, nope, this doesn't fit, this one doesn't fit. This. And we'll, we'll look for ways to exclude others. It's an exclusionary Mentality, and I think it's R.C. Sproul who makes the point that whoever was doing this exorcism, though he was not a member of the Twelve, was a follower of Jesus. 
And the problem from John's perspective was that he was not a follower of Jesus' disciples. Hear me out. Yes, we are called as followers of Jesus Christ to make disciples. And to make disciples who will grow up themselves understanding that, that they are called to make disciples of, of others who will make disciples. And you, you, know the, you know the string. You know how it feeds out. We've talked about that. But, but our, con our commitment has always got to be that of the Apostle Paul who said to the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. Not follow me because I'm me. Not follow me because I'm a follower of Christ. Not follow me as an end in itself. Follow me as I follow Christ. Our responsibility is to be Christ-like to others. Our responsibility is to show them the love of Christ, to teach them the word of Christ and the will of Christ and the way of Christ. But it is always pointing them to Christ. And when Christ has raised up others who are not like us, then we do not please him to say, we rebuked them, Jesus. You'll be happy to know we told him to stop casting out demons because he wasn't following us. You said they had cast out demons. And it developed the wrong-headed idea that anyone who would cast out demons would need their approval. That was a mission Jesus sent them on. Oh, dear people, theological bigotry, ministerial bigotry, church bigotry is dangerous. And what we ought to do is pray, dear God, help us to understand what it means to be with him, with Jesus, as we recognize what it means to be against him. And it's interesting, the very complaint that John made, in other words, we didn't think they were with us, he is acting in a way that makes, puts a question mark. Are you with Jesus? Because if you're with Jesus, you will agree with Jesus in his perspective. And so this complaint about outsiders is a, is a call to all followers of Christ to put money where our mouth is, that red, yellow, brown, black, white, they're all precious in his sight, that we would model that and demonstrate that, that people, people from different socioeconomic classes, that we would embrace any, up and in, down and out, no matter what current former lifestyle, that we would say to them, we, we love you for the sake of Jesus. And when they repent of sins and trust in Christ and identify as followers of Christ, that they don't have to jump through our hoops to be real followers. So there's this wrong attitude about outsiders. Then Jesus corrects it. He gives a correction to their bigotry. Verse 39 and 40, he said, do not stop him. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> the energy they were willing to spend to stop someone from doing the very thing Jesus had sent them previously out to do. Casting out demons is a good thing. In fact, Jesus rebukes the, the religious leaders in the passage we read in Luke when they said, well, yeah, he's, sure, he's cast out demons, but it's by, it's by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that he does that. And Jesus says, what kind of ridiculous reasoning of that is that? If Satan cast out Satan, he's destroying his own house. He said, and, and furthermore, in whose name and by whose power do your sons cast out demons? Apparently there were some, there were some sons of the Pharisees, a group of folks that were known for their exorcising activity. We won't go into whether or not it was really happening, but Jesus takes it and sticks it in their face. Who, who are they doing this by? Whose power? And he makes this amazing statement. He says, if you're not with us, if you're, if you're looking, if you're spending your time picking apart that which is being done in the name of the Lord to the glory of God, if you're not with us, you're against us. If you're not participating in the gathering with us and you're scattering, you, in other words, you, you won't, and you've known people like this, they wouldn't lift a finger, they wouldn't make a step to walk across the street and share the gospel with anybody, but they will move heaven and earth to try to undo something and stop something that's being done in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, whoever is doing a mighty work in my name, 
will be able, no one will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. In other words, if he is casting out demons in my name, he's not doing it for evil purposes. And he taught them this, the lesson that we need to learn. Whoever, the one who is not against us is for us. We ought to be looking for common ground. There are some irreducible, non-negotiable minimums that we dare not give up. We dare not give up the full, unquestionable authority of the Word of God. The Scripture is, as I tell you, and remind you and remind myself every Lord's Day, it is inerrant. It contains no error. It is uh, infallible. It is incapable of error because of its, of its author. And it is sufficient. We can find all that we need for life and godliness in the Word. It doesn't leave us guessing about the issues of life. Justification, as I mentioned earlier, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Christ alone is an irreducible, non-negotiable minimum. And people who will join hands with us on justification by faith, I can go a long way with them. They don't have to dot their I's and cross their T's on on my five expressions that I think the scripture teach about the doctrines of grace. But if they believe that a sinner is saved by grace through faith in the justifying work of Jesus Christ alone, that's a great place to hold hands. They may interpret end times differently than I do. They may nuance sanctification differently than I do. They may have different ideas about how many, how many parts make up the human being, if it's tripartite or bipartite. You see my point? Brothers and sisters, if we, if we wanted to, by the very nature that remains in us, the remaining sin in us that wants to divide, that wants to separate, that wants to find an excuse not to fellowship, we could pick one another apart and we would become a mentality of us four and no more. And like the guy who said one time, you know, I'm not so sure about anybody but me and thee. And sometimes I'm not so sure about thee. That's the mentality here. Without giving up on the gospel, because the gospel must be protected at all costs. We've got to grant that people, God saves people in other places For the longest, I kicked against this notion of, of, I was hearing from the mission field about the experience Muslims were having. And I thought I was being so, so theologically accurate. And, and thank God my friend Blaine Mays, who was, here I was in, a, in the safety of America saying, no, nope, no, 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 that just goes again. And my dear friend Blaine Mays, who's on the field, who's, who's living it every day. He was stateside, and I called him. I wasn't here then. I was somewhere. I called him. I said, "Talk to me, Blaine. I need to." And he began. He said, "Bill." He said, "I'm telling you, we're seeing Muslims come to Christ after they've they testify that they've had a vision of Jesus, who's come to them and rebuked them, and they come looking, wanting someone to tell them more about this this dream they've had." Sometimes you, you put down some of your theological shibboleths and say it is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Jesus sets the standard. The one who is not against us is for us. Is, is the person working to undo us? I pray on a regular basis with pastors in this area. 
And we have some interesting differences. But it's interesting when we pray how similar we sound. Praying in Jesus' name, asking God to move, to search us and cleanse us. So balance it, brothers and sisters. If, if the one, if he's not against us, these, these folks were not out casting demons out and, and, and undermining the disciples and Jesus. Jesus understands that they, uh, they understood that they were advancing the very same work. And balance that with Luke eleven twenty three 23, that whoever is not with me is against me. That if you, if you are, if a person is accusing Jesus and hurling invectives at Jesus and questioning the, the purity of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the person of Jesus, that person, he says, is against him. And if a person's not laboring, why are you doing? We want to gather in sinners to see them come to Christ. Jesus says, if, if that's not what you're about, then you're scattering. And that constitutes being against him. Jesus gives a corrective. We would do well to hear because of the danger in every heart. Finally, he challenges them to minister in his name. He basically says this, I wish you would put your energy <laughs> where it's well spent. Going around, casting aspersion on people that are different from you, casting aspersion on people who didn't come to you and get your is a waste of time and energy. I tell you truly, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Recognize the, the power of and the value of mercy. Do you get it there? Someone who would offer them, and that's what, he, that's what he basically says, he's giving an analogy here, who would offer a cup of water to drink to them because they belong to Christ. But that's time better spent. At that time, it's more valuable and more, more worthy of praise. Pretty much like you said to the church at Ephesus. If you go back and read that letter again, Revelation 2. He commends them. They're orthodox. Their doctrine is right. They're disciplined. They don't, they don't tolerate. They, they have an intolerance for wickedness. He commends that. But he says something astonishing. But you have left your first love. You see, defending orthodoxy and defending purity is right to do unless it becomes your first love. Jesus Christ is to be our first love. Showing mercy in His name is to be our first action. Treating with kindness those who bear his name, a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ. What he's basically saying is it would have been great if you, my disciples, would have seen them out casting demons and would have taken them some water and said, here, drink this. Let me, let me tie this together here. Five lessons I want us to learn from this passage. First, as followers of Jesus Christ, we must remember that we are called to make followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of ourselves. I, I was with a group ministering years ago. And their pastor had an incredibly dominant uh, personality and I, and I would meet with him and it was a church that met down the road and anytime I would talk to any member of that church I would say now what 
such a, well, and they would, but brother so-and-so says. Brother so-and-so says. Well, brother so-and-so says. And initially I thought, boy, isn't it great that they're, they're picking up what he says. But then it got, it got so, I thought, so I finally said, well, what does the scripture say? I don't want little Bill Askels. Right? One is enough. We're called to make followers of Jesus Christ, not followers of ourselves. Be sure when you're discipling somebody that you're pointing them to Christ. If you have a dominant personality, one of these overwhelming charismatic types that has a, a, a command of the scriptures, they'll be intimidated by that and, and think that they've got to become you to become a disciple. That's not true. You've got to become a follower of Jesus Christ to be a disciple. He'll take care of the rest. Second, People become followers of Jesus Christ from all kinds of different backgrounds and cultures. We need to grant kindness. We need to believe the best about others who name the name of Jesus unless there is something glaring about their, their doctrine of Scripture, their doctrine of justification. If they believe in justification by faith plus works, justification by faith plus sacraments, justification by, first, by faith plus tongues, anything that's added to the gospel is a red flag. But if it's justification by faith in Jesus Christ, we can go a long way with them. Third, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are not allowed to make the terms of following him narrower than he does. I had a friend of mine years ago. Sometimes I told him, I said, please don't let anybody know you're my friend. He lived in another state, and he would call me and say, yeah, I talked to a fellow today about the gospel. I said, really? And I asked him, I said, do you believe in election? I said, you didn't tell him you know me, did you? Do you believe in Jesus, the Son of God? Fourth, we would do well to believe the best about those who are not cut out of the same theological and ecclesiological cloth that we are. We have our standards and we do not uh, apologize for them. We try to make them gospel focused, gospel rich. But we need to grant that there are others who are cut out differently. Our Presbyterian friends are an example of that. We have some, I think, significant differences. But I love, I love them, and I love their love for the gospel. And thank God for that. And fellowship with them in that, in the gospel. Fifth, we should spend more time practicing the gospel through acts of mercy than measuring others by our standards. And considering whether or not they're gospel worthy. Are you with him? Are you with Jesus? Don't get, don't get sidetracked. Don't let somebody drag you off in, in some theological coup. We hold our standards. Remember here, you need to be in substantial, non-divisive agreement with the doctrine, discipline, and direction that we're, we're going. That doesn't mean that anybody who says I'm not is not a believer. We don't, we don't think that for a minute. We're not talking about interest into the kingdom. We're talking about interest into this church membership. If you're a leader here, you've got to be in, uh, in uh, wholehearted, not just substantial, wholehearted, non-divisive agreement with the doctrines, discipline, and direction of this ministry. But that does not mean that we look at others who would question and say, well, the fact that you question means you're not real. Brothers and sisters, there are plenty of Christians out there who are real. who do church differently than we do. Ask the folks that go to Haiti on mission. Their worship's quite a ride. Better be in good shape if you're going to worship with the Haitians. 
Ed Stetzer tells about going to a country, I believe, in West Africa. Now, if you go, Ed, Ed's preached here at our Founders Conference in the past. He's lost a lot of weight, but when he went there, he had not. And he said, for the offering, they begin to play and sing and beat drums, and the people get up, and they dance down to the front to give their offering. He said, if you can imagine me dancing down to the front to place my offering. And see, the danger we have is we'd say, well, we, just, we need to fix that. We need to teach them how to take up an offering. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they need to teach us. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are different ways. Maybe what we need to find out is, can we fellowship with you in the gospel? Karen and I attended a church meeting when we first got here. We didn't have Sunday night service one Sunday. I won't call the church, but we walked into it, and I thought I was in a biker bar. I was the only guy there in a coat and tie. And I kind of wished I'd have had my blue jean sleeveless jacket from the days when I rode my motorcycle so I could have worn my Captain America colors in there. And they worshiped the Lord. Let's, let's be like Jesus. Let's be like Jesus. Oh, love the truth, you betcha. Die for the truth, you betcha. Hold up the truth, you betcha. But make sure it's the truth. Make sure it's the truth as it's found in Jesus. Make sure it's the gospel that Jesus Christ says is the power of God to salvation. That Jesus Christ says is the non-negotiable, irreducible minimum that a person must believe in order to be saved. And not spend energy throwing cold water on those who are not like us, but rather run to them and give them a cup of water. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I read this passage and I think how many times in the past have I acted just like John and thought I was doing you a favor, thought how proud you would be of me. Help us, Lord, to balance Jesus' teaching and to stay out of the ditch of, of easy believism on the one hand and hard believism on the other hand. Stay in the gospel path of loving you, doing what you command of loving you and loving others and serving the world. That our energy be spent there <laughs> and not wasted running down people that are not like us and rebuking them for not being like us. Help us to focus on our becoming more like Jesus Christ and see that in others who are followers of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing as we close our service today.